This podcast is part of the Treksphere Network. To find more Star Trek related content, visit Treksphere.com. Hurry up. Well, it's been a while, but as you know, this is the measure of an episode where it is our continuing mission to explore what makes Star Trek proper Star Trek. And I'm going to get some controversy on this, I think, but not just a house episode. I'm Jonathan. Oh. Huh? I'm Paul, and the criteria by which we judge these episodes, number one, is there science fiction inherent to the plot of the episode? Number two, is that science fiction unique or novel in some way? And number three, uh, is there a number three? Yes. Number three. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Morality. (laughs) Is there a moral or ethical conundrum or dilemma presented by the episode? I'm Paul. And I'm Jonathan, but you already knew that. Would you already know that? <laughs> whatever you did first. Whatever. Uh, and I'm Jonathan. And this week we watched The Offspring, which is episode 16 of season three of The Next Generation of the overall Star Trek series franchise. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And the blurb says, hoping to further his creator's work and perpetuate his species, Data creates an android named Lal. That's the Netflix blurb, by the way. And boy, were there a lot of lols in this. Oh, so many lols. Uh, I am, I am, I'm torn. I know this is a very famous episode. Uh huh. Uh huh. Actually, a lot of them are famous. I say that every time we watch a next gen. But, right. Uh, <laughs> They're famous to us. <laughs> if we <laughs> remember famous. it, it must be famous. It's been famous for like 13 hours since the last time I saw. It. Right. But uh, I'm a little. I don't know. I'm divided on this on this episode. We can get into it a little bit, but uh, I'm curious. Did you watch this on any given speed, or was it one zero speed? I watched it for a while at one four speed, speed. Um, and then I watched it at one and a half. I I finished it at one and a half speed because I was watching on Netflix. I I did the same thing because I remember this being okay. Boy, this is number one. It's a data episode, Mm -hmm. and we all love data. Everybody loves data. Yep. Number two, I remember this as being a particularly science fiction esque episode. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, oh boy, I get to have my cake. And eat it too. And I have to say, well, okay, let's get into the plot. We can kind of slowly get into my discontent about this. Okay, so this before you start, um, I want to tell you this is the this was the first episode that was directed by Frakes. Um, okay, and that actually made it the first TV episode to be directed by a Star Trek cast member. Really? Interesting. Yeah, Shatner and Nemo had directed movies, but no TV actor or no none of the cast had directed any of the episodes also a much lesser known fact is that frakes played the skinless uh lol before <laughs> she chose you know she chose her outside like he was actually the person inside of the the suit yeah I'm sure if you do that that's why we never saw him uh, uh together yeah together well that and, right 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 uh yeah that's why he was on an away mission right <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I was going to say that's why they never showed him full body because he was standing in a pit to make sure that he was smaller than Data. Yeah, it was a very sophisticated, complicated set that they had to build where as they're walking down the hallway, they're picking up planks of wood for him to walk in and then putting them back down quickly so they can see it behind that there's that there's no break in the floor. Right, yeah. Very complicated, very, very impressive. Very unnecessary, but he said, this is <laughs> the way that I see this episode. I have to play a lol. Right. This character speaks to me. Because <laughs> it was obviously a male in that suit, right? I would expect that since they're paying for this actress, that she would also dress up in that suit. So, quick note there. Lol is actually played by... Um, uh, Ellie Park, I think her name was. I could be wrong on that. But um, mm-hmm. I, I assumed, because she does not look familiar to me at all, but apparently uh, there she does have a, a huge following because she was Lizzie McGuire's mom in the Lizzie McGuire TV series and the movie. So um, oh. so people, people okay. are aware of who she is. This was not a one-and-done guest star thing. Well, she did feel very generic looking on mm-hmm. purpose. It felt like oh, right. they oh, wanted yeah. to make her not be pretty... Or overly sexual, or or even right. going the other side, like it did feel very like this is Anne. purposeful. Yeah, <laughs> she was Anne. Yeah. Everyone's being an Anne hog. <laughs> you couldn't pick her out in a lineup of one. <laughs> She's right over there. You let her in. <laughs> <laughs> the measure an episode where we just spout off rest development quotes <laughs> about orphaned, Anne. Yeah. orphaned. Arrested Development quotes with no setup, just just the quote. 
but they're so good. It's not a yeah, race. No. Whoever oh, gets no. there first. <laughs> <laughs> See, you got to think of Anne as a backup. She's a backup. Um, yeah. So anyway, it just it it struck me is that oh well, the, she's not supposed to be recognizable to anyone. She's right. just sort of this this thing that walks around yeah. with shiny genitals. And there was an Andorian reference, which was kind of cool. I think that's that may be the only Andorian visual on the Next Generation. I could be wrong about that, but interesting. Yeah, yeah. that was that's a good point. I did notice that, and I was wondering when was the last time we saw an Andorian? I think it was two Enterprises ago. Yeah. I believe, yeah. So you know, the I think maybe the, uh, the the generator is is wearing thin in terms of its references, or it's just taking the holidays off, perhaps. I mean, maybe, but that was six weeks ago. It's a late holiday. Yeah, okay. take a late holiday. It's, it's taking Groundhog Day off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the episode starts, and uh, it starts off with Data putting a foot onto what is obviously a male leg. And with shiny genitals. And, well, it starts and, with everybody walking over to the to the room, to the lab. Three abreast. To... Yeah. Yeah. Like taking up all the hallway right. like assholes. <laughs> everybody has to like press themselves against the wall yeah. as they walk by. Yeah. 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 But it's I gonna mean, be a long episode if that's if that's the, what we're gonna be bitching about. <laughs> Which it won't be, but yeah. Um but yeah, and I I did I both like and dislike when a show does this. I, I liked the the banter that they had, but I dislike when they tell us so much about how secretive data has been and how they, they're dying to know what the surprise is and nobody's told them anything and data hasn't said anything. Um, you know, as they're as they're walking to figure it out. Like I feel like there could be so much more of showing in that manner i mean i don't or less telling even if there's no showing yeah they had to do a lot of work to set us up as to why data chose this moment to make mm-hmm. a lull right and so i guess that's what they were thinking i i felt like i so i i kind of understand because maybe those three people are his closest friends on the ship because yeah one might think oh why wasn't picard invited to this he's the captain of the ship and mm-hmm. you know, as as they talk about later that this is not about this is not a ship's operation issue this is a hey i'm having a baby everybody right but i I did also think it was strange that picard wasn't there because i mean as picard states later he was uh crucial to data's recognition as a human as a sentient being and able to reproduce in this manner and you know and even later on like there they have moments where data talks about how he does cherish their relationship and friendship uh and so it was just interesting that picard wasn't invited to the initial reveal that's a good point that's a good point I'll buy it. And so in this course of this intro, they show that there is a special guest appearance by Whoopi Goldberg as Guinan. And boy, do I hate it when they spoil her appearance on the episode. I want it to be where she just shows up. Just that would be cool. Put yeah. her at the end. I'm tired of knowing when, like, it's almost like a spoiler. Right, it is. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was very excited to see Guinan was, uh, was on the show. I wonder if she's in every episode. She can't be. Right? No, she's not. In the, not not in the show. Sorry, in see in like season three. Season. Oh, three, gotcha. Kind of right. I wonder when her first appearance is, and I feel like her first appearance. There's nothing special about it. You know, she's just like, she's the bartender, and somebody goes to talk to her, and that's just how it goes. Yeah, yeah. And it is interesting that we never really get a sense of Guinan as to, as to why she's on the ship, why she chose that ship. I know that she and Picard eventually, it's it's established that they have a history that Picard mm-hmm. does not know about. Mm-hmm. But it's not like we see Guinan and Picard dining all the time right? or having a lot of discussions. He usually comes to her only when he needs advice about some crisis. So – I want to know more about why she's there. I guess she just likes the idea of exploring and also being a bartender. You know, I mean, she's what, 800 years old or something like that. Well, and she's one of the last of her kind um, because the board destroyed her planet and she's. We don't know that yet, do we? I don't know if we know. I don't I don't know. I I don't think so, because I, I well, I think that comes up at the end of this season, like when they're talking about the best of both worlds or when they're talking about destroying Locutus. Locutus of Borg. (laughs) Yep, that's the one. That's the one. Okay, so... so Not Lacutus of Zeron 3. <laughs> of the Zatarians? Yeah. That would have been cool. They bring back the Zatarians? That would be cool. Oh, what if... No, we're not going down that road. Not for this episode. <clears throat> not for this episode. Um, 
I was going to say. Okay, so the idea, the plot of this episode is basically Data has made a child. He has made someone named Law. She's an android just after himself. It's the only one of her kind, or they are the only ones of their kind. And it turns out that, so Data is kind of rearing his new offspring. Mm-hmm. That's the name of the episode. <laughs> and and I, it's, it's very unclear. So this is where it kind of breaks down for me. This is where the, I mean, yes, it is arguable that there's lots of science fiction in this. And yes, it is novel. I will give you that. Mm-hmm. But I feel like it is not novel in the right ways. Because they go through this thing where he's kind of teaching her to sit and teaching her what a painting is and what a flower is. And she can already walk. She can already do all of these very sophisticated, complicated things that babies take a very long time to do. Right. And it's very they, – they didn't do a lot of work on considering – okay, if, if an android were to make an android and it is based on Data's data banks or whatever. Like he, she has basically the entire computer in her head just as Data does. Right. Yeah. But I, I mean, it did go in phases, but keep going. I don't think you're talking about that part. No, my point is that throughout the course of, of data teaching lol, how to be an Android, how Mm -hmm. to be a functional Android, Mm -hmm. I feel like they did not do anything creative with that. They did the thing where if we were to magically kind of birth a human into adulthood, (laughs) that, this is what we would kind of have to do is that maybe they'd be able to walk. Actually, it felt kind of like someone woke up from a coma and lost all their memory and they kind of had to relearn how to be a person but remembered how to walk and how to eat and how to breathe and all those different things. It well, felt more like that. Right. So what, what I kind of took it to be, as we see later, she was able to emulate things she could see. So swallowing was a struggle but walking was fine. And – she like he didn't need to teach her how to sit he could just do it and then she would follow uh but everything in the room he needed to explain like it was a chair and it was a painting and the difference between a painting and a flower and that kind of thing so that's the kind of thing i feel like an android would already know there would be a comparative thing right maybe right so i think i think that that goes to the phases that he was talking about right I, I don't know. If, if, didn't it feel like we could be doing a lot more interesting things in terms of what an android, how an android would rear another android? It feels like it wouldn't be this thing where it's a facsimile of rearing a human. Right. Yeah. I'm, I mean, there, were, there could have been a lot more things that very, very clearly identified her as an android and her as a threat that Starfleet <sighs> – I don't know if she like they were worried about her as a threat, but you know, like showing her grip something and destroy it in her hand. And so, you know, data talks about how like they are, they are stronger than humans and they live in a human world. So they have to be more delicate and learn to grip things in a way that doesn't destroy them. Right. And even Picard references that idea that yes, she's a baby who can, has the strength of 10 men. Right. Which I completely forgot when Troy said, clearly you've never been a parent. My immediate thought was, oh, and you have? But <laughs> Well, had she? She had. She had, yeah. At this point, she had. Very briefly. She, yeah, she had that space baby. But that was also, like, the, the argument. You know, like, I, I don't feel that she can justify calling herself an apparent, uh, a parent in a way that demonstrates she raised a child from birth over years. Because right. – that child was an adult in, what, two weeks? <laughs> I think that maybe what the idea was is that she has spoken with so many parents right, that's, and yeah. heard so many things because she is the ship's counselor that mm-hmm. she, she at least has some vicarious idea of what it's like that Picard would not. That, yeah. that's, that, was my, that was how I took it. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I just wanted there to be a little bit of procedural stuff. I mean it was all procedural this episode, obviously. Which I'm, I should be happy about. I don't know what I, why I'm complaining, but <laughs> I, I, if, I, if we're going to drill down into it, I feel like it could have been more creative. It could have been a little bit less '60s robot. What you know? What am love? Dana? Right. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. uh, a little bit less of that, and a little bit more of oh, like you said, you know, picking things up. Like you can't just crush people. You can't just go around – like someone maybe pissed her off. Right. And so she just beats them up or throws them down the hallway. That that kind of thing where – Right. Or even maybe, she just pushes them and they fly down the hallway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, something that implied or at least was coming from the idea that she is a new life, not just a human life. Or even mm-hmm. the fact that that's there, they – 
both are striving to be human. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I think they, they could have done more with the, the Android side of things. And she never had a trial and error moment, which so frequently happens in these episodes. You know, the only thing right. that happened yeah. happened to her, not through her causing it, where she was ostracized by the children. I enjoyed the education of Picard in this episode. I enjoyed the things where he says, look, shouldn't you have told me? I would have liked to have been briefed about this this project you started, Data. And he said, you know, I've never seen other people talk about their procreation on the ship with you. Why you know, is this – I'm sorry. Would you want me to kill her? You know, that kind of right. thing. Right, like, yeah. It felt very passive aggressive the way he would answer these questions when people were telling him how to raise his child and what, the, what to do with his child. It felt very like – I'm sure the admiral, when he was first becoming a father, didn't know anything about becoming a father either. And then he turns around and drops the mic. Right. You know, right. It just felt, it <laughs> right. felt very much that, that thing. And it, it's – you want to give Data the benefit of the doubt that he wasn't being passive aggressive. But he was like – he was being like – he was a little middle finger a little bit. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, then we come into the whole Admiral subplot, I guess, of this, where the Admiral now wants to take ownership of Lal and go study her. And he's not going to take no for an answer. He sh he showed up on the ship knowing he, he was going to take her. Right. 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 Conceit. Ostensibly, he was there to observe and then decide yeah. whether or not she was going to come back to the De De Daystrom Institute. Yep. Daystrom. Mm -hmm. uh, where they also race cars. <laughs> The Daystrom 500. The, yeah. But so that was – I mean I, I felt like they wrote that character in such a way where we are there, – there is no conundrum of morality where it's like we know uh, what the right thing to do is. You know, that I, nobody agreed with – ever agrees with him or at least even takes his argument to, to heart. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, I can see what they what he means. They they have to train her in a certain specific way, and nobody ever sided with him. Right. And I hate it when they do characters like that. Yeah. Because I I fall for it every time. I'm like, you asshole! You are not going to touch Law. He belongs with Data on the ship. <laughs> and it's like you get into this emotional like spiral. I'm like, wait a minute! I just I be, I'm being manipulated here because the the admiral was a one dimensional character except for that last scene where he explains right. when, where he yeah. suddenly cares. He suddenly cares and is actually like a great actor and seems to have a lot of empathy and sympathy for what's happening going on with Data. Yeah, uh, I was like, oh wow. He actually is a person. Right. But the thing that pisses me off about that. So first off, this is his only episode. And I had no idea that that was the case because he is such an ass in this episode that I thought he showed up more. <laughs> you thought that Law killed him at the end of the episode? That they didn't see him anymore? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but I – none of this would have happened if he had just left Law alone with Data because Data could have and, – and Troy because Data and Troy could have helped her cope with the emotions – because she probably would have developed pleasant emotions before she had a negative one. That's possible. I think it was just a an overload of data. Is that the idea? Not data, data, but right. information. And that it, it didn't matter. She could have just eaten a too rich of a sundae and it would have happened. That kind of thing. Oh, may, maybe, yeah. Speaking of eating. So they do have a e couple of eating things. where yes. And so I'm wondering. So she actually takes stuff in and swallows it. Right. So, is there a tank that they have to empty at the I, end of the day? I feel like Data did say something about that at some point where he – I mean he just said that he can – he doesn't require it, but he is able to eat and drink like others. But yeah. he, yes, like that would that see, would stand want, to reason. <laughs> I want to see – I feel like they need to handle this in Discovery or whatever. You know, <laughs> so Something. that was another thing that I realized in this episode. Um, you know, they they had they've had more human appearing AI in other episodes uh, of the original series, but they've always been they haven't been AI. They've been controlled by someone else, and the true AI has always been a giant computer or machine or something like that. Right, and so with data talking, you know. That's what makes him one of a kind. There have been other androids in multiple episodes, but they've always been controlled by someone else. And so this episode made me realize that that's how and why Data is unique. Even in Picard, the 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 androids that are being used on the outpost, you know, for mining, like they are being controlled as well. Yes, they they feel incomplete ne next to Data, right? Yeah, they, they, they don't feel like full autonomous beings. well right and that's the thing yeah data is the only autonomous android the autonomous human looking android right right yeah yeah you're right 
And I felt like I, what I didn't like was that for Lol, the way her movements were, it was like she was doing the robot the whole time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she she kind of walked awkwardly, and her her head movements were very kind of angular and quick and non-human. And I understand they were trying to demonstrate that she's young and hasn't quite figured it out. But it, could you find a better way that wasn't so sixties? Ro- it was just so sixties robot to me. It's like. Tell me, Father, what I should do with plant, you know, that kind of thing. Right, and, right. And I, just, I don't know. It's, I, I get it. It's the, what, 91 at this point? 90? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they were kind of still getting their sea legs with this stuff. But I want to know, like, I want to see something a little bit more creative than what we would come to expect from a robot trying to learn how to be a human. Right. Well, and again, Data, or Brent Spiner actually talked about that, you know, and, and we've talked about it uh, in a roundabout way. But you know, Nimoy was the first Vulcan. So everything he did set the precedent. And Brent Spiner was talking about that as well, how, you know, people ask him how he was able to to act so much like an android. And he said, because I was the first one. Like, I got to do whatever I wanted, and, and that's what an android does. Well, and he did a great job. Well, yeah. Uh, but just speaking to the body language, I th- it may also have been intentional. I mean, they... They didn't play it up as much as they should have, but she definitely lost it, lost the the jerkiness and the stiff behavior when she started flirting with Riker. That's true. Although it quickly ends because she picks him up and kisses him. Right. And it just it felt very like I know why they did it, but it just it did not feel like it belonged in this kind of episode. This whole episode felt like it didn't belong in this kind of episode. It felt like somebody wrote this outside of the paradigm of Star Trek and science fiction, you know, like mm-hmm. it was still well-written and yeah, it was oh still, yeah. it was well-directed. And I, you, you get through the episode on an emotional arc and you kind of feel bad for date at the end. And they, they did that all very well, mm-hmm. but I feel like that is where it failed was it's over dependency on sentimentality. Hmm. It did feel like if you're talking about robots and Brent Spiner says this many times in the episode, I cannot give this thing love. <laughs> right. It's my child. I cannot, I, I'm incapable of it. He, you know, he, he did not dance around this idea that I, that uh, of, of him being a robot. Right. And it comes to be that lol can feel somehow mm-hmm. it's never explored. And you're like, Oh, interesting. So what's right. going on here? Cause there is an emotion chip that comes up in the, in the show later, I think. And right. so somehow lol has feelings or develops feelings, but I felt like, especially at the end, why not make it go somewhere more disturbing about the emotions? Because it does get kind of disturbing when, when Lol starts feeling bad. Right. You know, you, she's, not, she's not kind of breaking down in your normal human way where you kind of put your head in your hands and you have a good cry type of thing. Right. Well, and she's not breaking down in a normal android way where, you know, she's going beep boop, derp. <laughs> <laughs> or they didn't do the obvious thing where her speech is all messed up and it's like, I am breaking, help me, you know, that right. kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, but it did feel awkward. It felt yes. disturbing in a way Yeah, where she's, she's kind of pushing on herself and beating herself. Mm-hmm. And, and as, as I was thinking, oh, this is interesting. What's she going to do? Is there a murdering spree? In our f- near future. <laughs> right. Looking for data, looking for dad. Yeah. But they didn't quite go there. They kind of leaned on that, on that over sentimentality, which I, which got me, you know, it tugged on me a little bit. Oh, for know, sure. When, especially in the end when, yeah. when lol dies, like that was well done. That was super well done. I just wanted it to be, I don't know, a little bit, I guess more teeth once again. Yeah. I felt like it lacked some teeth in terms of the consequences of something like this. Mm hmm. Well, yeah, and th- that was the part that irritated me so much is, uh, again, all of this was caused by the Admiral, and then he comes out all sentimental, you know, and he's like, I- I've never seen anybody work so hard, but there's nothing that anybody could have done. And I'm like, yeah, there kind of was. You could have backed off, like, from the get-go. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's arguable that, that this would have happened regardless of right. the, the Admiral trying to steal her away. It, we would have never have known. I guess that's the, the bittersweetness of the idea, but... Well, uh, and... I don't, I don't know how you're going to feel about this, but I was I was super upset to read it. Um, there was going to be an episode in season five where Lore absconded the, the lol body and reactivated it and gave her uh, Sung's emotion chip. Interesting. So she's going to become a villain too? Right. I, I know. I don't know. But you could yeah. only make her a villain. 
who who ultimately redeems herself, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, but yeah. I, do I feel okay about that? Would I? Would that be okay? What bringing Lull back? I think so, and hanging out with Uncle Lore for a little while. <laughs> yeah. I think that would have been great. No, but instead we got, you know, episodes like Masks. <laughs> well, this is only season five. I think Masks is This like is season, season three. Seven. Yeah. No, sorry. The, you said season five, right? Right, right. Which was, was still a great five? season. But my, my point is, like, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't produced for season five, you know, and instead of going, oh, well, never mind, like, throw that script in the trash, like, they should have held on to it. And when they were like, should we do masks? They should have been like, no, let's do this episode with Lol and Lore. <laughs> That's a good point. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. I, I wonder, though, they, they didn't do that as much as, they, as much as they could, though, where they're bringing back old characters. They did that a little bit with Denise Crosby. I think mm-hmm. twice they did mm-hmm. that. Yeah. So they did that a little bit. And Guinan is sort of a recurring character. I don't know if that counts. But they did kind of steer clear of it becoming a reference of itself, which is very much different from today's TV culture. Right. But maybe that was a good thing. Maybe they, if they, they felt like, eh, we already did that. Or no. I did a lull. No. And I think that that's why it makes, that's, that's what makes season three so great. And I've talked about it before is it makes these allusions to things that happened in the first two seasons. And again, like it's not things that you needed to see for the episode to make sense. Troy talking about, you don't know what it's like to be a parent. Picard talking about how he was, the advocate for data having sentient being rights, you know, like these are, these are things that don't need to be seen for us to understand what's happening in the episode. And so these callbacks and references should be happening, but they didn't do that. No, I agree. I I agree with you. I I agree. There should be some continuity between seasons and episodes so that it's not just truly or literally a, episode after episode after episode that are not related to each other. Mm -hmm. But, but the idea of bringing back a character to have an episode about that character that they've already kind of explored. I I understand the reticence to do that, that we already said that, like what what else are we going to say about this that we haven't already said? Like they, they wanted to use lol more as a character device. uh, Sorry, as a data character device Mm -hmm. rather than she was just a character that popped up and, and then died. Right. Like most of, Kirk's and Scotty's girlfriends in the TOS. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, <laughs> Scotty's girlfriends. <laughs> we uh, had many. You know we had many. Right. But, I mean, as as Data's child and as Data's child being abducted by his brother, like, I feel like there there are more stories that could be gleaned from this character. And it's, I mean, from, from any character. Anytime, like, a character is left on it, uh, open-ended um you know they don't they they don't have a clear and distinct resolution in at the end of the episode of like dying or right you know right. Some, something along those lines um i i feel like with that character having already been established you can develop a new story that would take that character or one of the crewman characters you know in a different direction because if you can do it for seven seasons with these seven core actors then you can easily do a second episode with a character that we've seen before. I think I would sign off on this if it was a if they made Lol a perversion of what she was supposed to be. Not not sexual perversion, you pervert, but I'm you know something that is just off and and not no longer awkward, but disturbingly bad in sure. such a way where like what like what did you become? What did Lore do to you? Or what who taught you this? You know, <laughs> what what's going on? Like the Borg or something like that. Well yeah, I mean there there were a couple of questions that she asked that that could easily have have foreshadowed those those dark turnings. You know, why do you try to emulate humans if you will never become them? Um, you know, and she right. she has surpassed her father in her abilities, both with contractions and in ability to feel you know, so she could easily think that she is now superior to humans. Conversely, you know, yes, you're talking about not perverting it in a perverted way, but she was so focused on flirting and affection that she could have become kind of, you know, one of those villainous, like a seductive. Evil Lynn? Uh, yeah, like an evil, like a temptress type thing. Right. Um, yeah. Well, she does show that like sexuality is kind of interesting to her. Right. Because they have that whole scene with Guinan where they're going to go have sex. Mm-hmm. By, by the way, implied sex on Next Gen doesn't yeah. happen that often. Which also this this is a rough scene. Um, you know, talking about how like sexual representation. 
um, the original ep- the the original lines talked about how when a man and a woman fall in love, and Guinan uh, Whoopi Goldberg was like, "This is the future. Like, there's going to be so much more fluidity." Uh, and so she said, "When two people fall in love." Um, and they wanted to have two men holding hands in the background. And the producers were so opposed to that that they actually had a producer stay on set during the entire filming of this scene to make sure it never happened. <laughs> what I would have done if I were Frakes is in every other scene, there would have been two, man, two men holding hands <laughs> right, in the background. Just in the background, yep. Yeah. That's what I would have done. Yeah. Yeah, I like the I mean, I like the idea of pushing it out. Like, you know how you felt when you first saw the Borg, where there was obviously a person there, but completely disassembled right. in such a way. You just felt like, God, it's so disturbing. Like, what, what's the story behind this? Is that mm-hmm. a, what, what's going on? Like, that's how it would need to be with Lull in a different way than the Borg, I think. Sure. Yeah. But they didn't uh, do that. But yeah, how great, how great was Whoopi Goldberg in this or Guinan? Her name is Guy. She's always always great. That's always great. I know. She's always great. And she's so under, we've talked about this before. She's so understated. It's almost like another Nimoy in a way where you, they say very little, but Mm -hmm. everything that they say is, is right. Like it feels right. It has such gravitas to it. Yeah. That I don't know. It felt, it, it just feels good. Whenever a guy, she always, you always feel like a warm blanket. Uh huh. Wrapped Uh in, wrapped in Guy. What? That sounds gross. Uh, <laughs> That's what Lal would do. <laughs> right. There you go. Yeah, she yeah. literally wears the skins of other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what do we what do we think here? Is this a uh, yes, 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 yes? Right. But uh, so here's here like. Uh, oh wow! So we have some contention. Yeah. Well, because I've been Ooh. I've been thinking about you know your comment previously. And this episode, and I, I don't know if I'm painting it too broadly or if it's genuinely not a a proper Star Trek episode. Because you could do this with an adopted refugee and someone saying, "No, you can't have that child," and you're you saying, you know, but that is my child, and a stray bullet or something impacts the child where they can't save the child, you know, and the person who was telling you that the child needed to be returned to its origin country is there to help you. And they couldn't do anything in the end anyway. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like this, this is where the sentimentality is acting against our criteria in a way, or it's it's sort of subverting the actual science fiction of the show because they let the sentimentality take over. Right, where it's well, both at the end more... and throughout, you know, the the raising of a child, like the, the the you you have to bond with Lol the same way that Data does, and so they're they're acting on your sentimentality throughout the entire thing. Right, I don't know, and she chooses to like. There's a point where Picard asks her, uh, "Do you want to stay on the ship?" And she says yes, and that's a big moment for for her and for Picard and all that stuff. But I feel like that's the moment where it could have turned. It could have turned into more of a science fiction-y thing. And then it just turned into, well, we all think that she should stay on the ship. And that's that became the episode at that right, point. Right, right. And I, I don't know. I, I feel like there it is. it does feel novel to me that a, an android made an android. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's definitely right. The 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 sci fi that is there. I yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's That's thin fair. for you. Like it is thin. It's thin for me too. Like I felt like it could have gone in a much different direction. Mm-hmm. But no, like I can't sit here and say there's no sci fi. But the sci fi that was there was presented in a novel way. Like that that doesn't work. Like if the, for there to be our second criteria, there has to be the first criteria. <laughs> Right. You know, the yeah. third one is the one that stands alone. So, yeah, that's that's fair. It was presented in a novel in a unique way, and therefore there was sci-fi. Like, I just... Also... Yeah. Also, Guinan. <laughs> Our fourth criteria trumps all other three. Is <laughs> Guinan in the Guinan. episode? Yeah. <laughs> Guinan, question mark? Right. Um, is that our fourth criteria? No. <laughs> no, it's just a nice little sub-attachment to it. Um, yeah. I mean, so far, every episode we've seen her in has been a proper Star Trek, because I think we've only seen her in two, Time Zero and this one. Oh, yeah. Man, she, it feels like she should be in every episode. I know. <laughs> it should be a moment. Yeah. yeah. Just, yep, just those little moments. 
But I also like, I mean, I don't know how often those scenes are written for her, but like, yeah, I wonder how her schedule played out her scenes. You know, like well, you they, said, you've, you've yeah. said many times where not many times, one other time, <laughs> I don't know that she, her availability would affect the script writing. Well, yeah, that's they what would. I'm wondering. Like, did they always have a scene available for her in each episode and just, they put it in when she was there or did she say, you know, guys, I can be there for these episodes. And so then they wrote the scenes in for her. Well, they should always be writing. They should still be writing scenes. I think she's going to be in the new show, the new season of Picard. I think. I hope so. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. I believe she is. Man, this new season of Picard is going to be awesome. There's time travel. There's Guinan. There's other cast members of Next Gen. Yeah. Too bad we're not talking about it. <laughs> Just wait. Just wait. <laughs> For our 200th episode. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be watching Picard season one. Um, speaking of which, uh, speaking of Picard, in season one of Picard, Data uh, he talks about how Data always wanted a daughter. And it's been seen as a continuity error because obviously, as we just saw, he did not choose her gender, um, which again was very progressive. I, I don't even think that was, that, that was a futuristic sci-fi concept of like letting your, je- your child choose their gender. And now that's a thing that parents do. Right. Um, But it could be argued that Picard wasn't around for the conversations that Data was having where he said, like, he's going to let her choose her gender. Right. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So what do we think? Is is this a proper Star Trek episode? Yeah, it is. Like I said, you can't you can't have two without one. And the fact that two is there must mean that one is there. That's true. Yeah. Um, Is that a is that bad for is that a bad criteria uh, function that. They're not independent of each other. I don't think so because, I mean, it could – because the thing that makes Star Trek Star Trek is presenting sci-fi in a unique and novel fashion. You know, but we just watched North Star where it was a straight-up Western. Like that's not – that's not a sci-fi episode. That's, you know – It's barely a Star Trek episode. Right. It's barely a Star Trek episode. Um and and so I think think that it's fine to have the two connected. You know, if if the sci-fi is not presented, then it's not – a Star Trek episode, and if it's if it's trope sci-fi, which we we've, we've seen I think twice so far, you know, then it's it's hard to call that a Star Trek episode because there's nothing there's they're they're not bringing anything new to the table, which is what Star Trek is great for doing. Right. Okay. So all right. Well, and I enjoy the episode. I just yeah. I, I I feel like it its potential it didn't live up to its potential. Let's put it that way. Right. No. Yeah, there were there were a lot of questions that it presented that it did not answer or they didn't that it there are a lot of questions that that it didn't ask but it presented the situation where it could have been asked there we go jj abrams is watching he's like doing this all wrong you gotta (laughs) ask the questions and then not answer right i did have one last note it's just kind of a a fun little note the um the lift that lol was in was used as the the board queen's platform in a voyager episode how'd they keep these things around right i would think that they would just dismantle them immediately especially the amount of time that occurred between those two although if this is like 91 then voyager was soon well that was that we're, we're still a decade away from that episode it's crazy to keep all that stuff yeah but also the fact that star trek was still on i could see them saying well let's not get rid of this star trek stuff because we might need it right good point good point it'd be cool if <laughs> <laughs> if data you know in choosing all of the uh the the skin for lol mm-hmm. was a borg skin <laughs> right well yeah i mean he didn't he didn't pick but yeah that was one of the ones that she liked and he's like yeah uh... <laughs> 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 let's rethink this yeah let's rethink it uh, well, reboot uh, all right well let's see what we're watching next all right star trek Enterprise, Season 2, Episode 20, Horizon. When Enterprise investigates a planetary phenomenon, Mayweather takes the opportunity to visit the cargo ship where he was born and raised. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> Sounds riveting. <laughs> right. Although I, I will say, like, I, I did not think that Mayweather had any centric episodes. So if this does turn out to be a centric episode, that's... That'll be kind of nice. It'll be good to see. <laughs> well, maybe they learn from their mistake. <laughs> right? That this is the only episode. Yeah, oh, the only never one. again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, uh, let's, I mean, we cannot comment. We can't opine on this. This is a very kind of dry, what do you call it? Blurb? Yeah. Thing to say. 
Yeah. Well, let's go watch it. I've been Paul. I've been Jonathan. And this has been the measure of an episode. You. Oh man, I. What do I want to? You, you, you can do it. You can do it. I know, but I you always want to. Uh, all right. But you already knew that. Oh boy. <laughs> Soon we'll get so good at it. Right. We won't need to put on the uh, the requisite. Oh boy, at the end. Yeah. But I. Who who do I keep wanting to make him? I don't know. I'll think about it. I'll let you know. <laughs>